Good afternoon. I want to thank you on behalf of the family for coming to remember Marie's life. We're grateful that we can gather like this even during a pandemic and have you here as friends and family. We know that there's others that would like to be and wish they could have been here with you as well. Uh, there are a number that are probably joining us on live stream even as we have this time together. My name is Daryl, and I'm the minister from Lloydminster Gospel Fellowship, and I'm just here today to help you, to be with you, and uh, to guide you along in your grieving process. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you know all, you're above all, and you're in all. So, Lord, we invite you to have your way today as we remember Marie's life. Father, we thank you that you do comfort those who mourn. So as we mourn together, we thank you, Father, that you are here and that you'll be with us. Be in our thoughts, in our prayers, and in our words. In your name, amen. As I was thinking about life and Marie's life, you may be wondering why as a minister, when maybe she was not, so, she was not religious at all, why as a minister here, um, I'm just here to help you, to walk along with you. I'm, I'm not here to be preachy at you. I'm not here to, to twist your arm at anything. I simply want to help you in your, in your processing of grief and loss. Because human life is sacred. It's sacred in its being born, and it is sacred in its living, and it's absolutely sacred in its dying. We all know that we were born, and the only thing we don't know is when we will die. We aren't given that. And so it's this journey that we make along these days and these years that we are granted and given to make the most of them, to live them well. And as we do that, we can definitely think about grace. We shall celebrate Marie's living, and we shall grieve Marie's dying, because we know the truth of William Blake's words, joy, joy and woe are woe and fine. Under every grief and pine, one's joy was still entwined. It is right. It should be so. We were made for joy and woe. Today we must grieve Marie's death. But we must also celebrate her life. Though our grief is strong and we must mourn, we will not be led the shadow of death obscure the living who has touched us so many times in many ways, filling our life with memories, meaning, and love. Let us be wise enough and brave enough this afternoon, to honestly and bravely celebrate a human's life, the life that Marie lived. So we have come together, and it is good that we've come together, because we need each other in empathy and consolation, and because we need, need each other in courage and wisdom to face Marie's death and to celebrate her life, and to show our love and support for her family. To those who knew her, loved her the most. It's good, it's right, and fitting that we have to come, come together because a human life is sacred in its being born, in its living, and also in its dying. At this time, Blake is going to come and 
lead us in amazing grace. Thank you for that. This time, the family's going to come and share the eulogy. Jackson is coming up first, and uh, then they're going to just follow one after the other. So, Jackson, why don't you come? Good afternoon.
Thank you for attending in these difficult times on such short notice. Marie was my spouse and the mother of my daughter, Madeline Taylor. She was my best friend and her loss is intense. I am overwhelmed by her absence. Being with, in Westminster without her is surreal. Marie was the one who was eloquent. She studied linguistics and classics at the University of Alberta and spoke French and English fluently, fluently, but also conversationally in Latin, Korean, Arabic, Burmese, and many other languages. So I feel inadequate in giving this eulogy. We often quoted from the scene in Alley Hall to each other. Marie, love is too weak a word for what I feel for you. I love you, you know, I love you. I love you, two Fs, yes. That is how I felt for Marie. Marie and I met about a decade ago and we hit it off instantly. We began talking almost every day while she was away on her adventures around the world. As I, as I think many of you know, she spent over a decade living in Asia, the Middle East, and other parts of the world. She constantly traveled and did what I considered crazy things, like visiting North Korea and skydiving. <laughs> we talked about politics and world affairs. She was deeply thoughtful and cared about the people of the world. She talked about literature. When, she met, when we met, she was reading Proust. And she sent me a lot of silly cat puns. Marie had a dark and silly sense of humor that was heavily influenced by her time abroad. She thought poo was very funny, a thing she, car she shared in common with many Koreans, which was the place she felt at ho home the most other than Canada. Exactly four years ago today, sorry, we were sitting in the Pooh Cafe in Seoul, drinking a blossoming rose tea latte and lunch out of a porcelain shaped like toilets. <laughs> Most of all, Marie was someone who was always there for me. I was struggling a lot around the time we met. and she was the one I could talk to. Marie always understood what it was like to struggle and we bonded over difficulties. She would send me a message every day when I woke up to make sure I was okay. She would send me gifts to make me smile. Shiny Korean ties, horrible Asian candy, a flying pig, and many postcards and letters. We truly began our relationship about six years ago when I visited her in Kuwait. Visiting her in the Middle East was an eye-opening experience. Although I was completely culture shocked, Marie was completely immersed wherever she went. One thing we shared was a love of animals. And every day she took me to the seawall in the Persian Gulf to visit the stray cats. She was truly annoyed when they liked me as much as her. When walking back from the Gulf one day, we heard some panicked meows and found a tiny orange kitten trapped in a storm drain. We were really upset, but we thought it better to let him try to find his way out and decided to come back later. We came back the next day and the little kitten had gotten even more frantic. Unfortunately, the storm grate was cemented shut and we couldn't reach him. So we hatched a plan to help this kitten. We went to the tiny little stores that they have in the Middle East, and we got a can of tuna, some rope, and a plastic bag from her apartment. Marie and I then tried to lure this kitten into the plastic bag so we could try to pull him through the storm grate. After about an hour, we had gathered quite a crowd who were curious about what two Canadians were doing laying in a busy Kuwaiti road. One of the men that had joined the crown had the idea to bring a coat hanger, which let us control the bag better. And at last, we were able to save this tiny kitten. When we pulled him out, he could barely meow, 
was covered in dirt and garbage. His claws were worn down to nubs from trying to get out. And Herod's eyes was, were infected. Although I had to leave to go back to Canada, Marie nursed this kitten back to health. She named him Oscar and found him a nice home with, with a family that would play with him. Shortly later, Marie came to live with me in Canada and met what was my cat at the time. He was named Paul's Graf, and she told me she would never like him because she wasn't there to get him with me. Within a few months, the cat had won her over. He was big, orange, dumb, and cuddly. He became her fluffy guy and ultimately renamed him Catwood and nicknamed him Mr. McFlufferton. We can all see him. That is an actual photo of him. The, yeah. the last photos she ever sent me were of her and Mr. McFlufferton, and I will always remember how much she loved him. I have literally hundreds of selfies with them because she sent me one every few hours. <laughs> Having decided she loved this cat, she decided further that she could not share him with me. Even when he was my cat, she would take him from me if he tried to approach and tell him he was wrong and that he needed to cuddle her instead. I officially gave him to Marie for one Christmas, which she said was the best present she ever got. When Madeline was born and placed on Marie, she just began to shake uncontrollably. The weight of the responsibility of being a parent to such a little thing was overwhelming for us both. We love Madeline so much. Marie was a truly special mother. She enriched Madeline's life in countless ways. She spent all her time cooking wonderful food, thinking of crafts, buying toys, clothes, and taking on, her on what she called adventures, even if just to the grocery store. Madeline may be the only kid with her own Instagram account with thousands of carefully curated photos. Marie wasn't only a mother to Madeline, but she loved to be involved in the lives of her nieces, Rosebud, Josephine, Victoria, and nephew Carter. She had a truly special bond with Tori and told me often how much she loved her. When Madeline was a year old, we decided to move to Korea to teach English. We, cap we packed up the cats, a couple suitcases, and Madeline, we flew across the world. While they, she, we were there, she showed us how to adventure we spent every day, every weekend, going to castles, temples, festivals, and many other things. In Korea, Marie was accepted to a nursing program in Edmonton, and that's where she spent her last few years. Nursing fit Marie. Her whole life, she cared about others. She wanted to help people through a health system she often struggled with. Marie will be deeply missed by me and Madeline. It is a hole in our lives that can never be filled. I would like to end this eulogy with a promise to Marie. Marie, I will try my best to raise Madeline with the love and enrichment that you gave her. Sometimes I will even go overboard but I probably won't buy her more than five Halloween costumes a year. <laughs> Thank you for taking the time to listen to me and for being here. Her mother, Erdine, would like to share some words about who Marie was to her.
Thank you to all for gathering here today, either in person or online, to bid farewell to my beloved sweet Marie. Now, as matriarch of the Jack Eaton family, I am humbled and powerless as my world has crumbled beneath me. As I begin to rate this, I think, well, who will proofread it for me? Marie will. Easter is this weekend. Who will be excited about the Easter Bunny tracks? Marie will. Slow down, Ardeen. How do I give a eulogy when there are no words? Bear with me as I begin at the beginning. Marie was born on May 14, 1982, the second child to Jack and myself in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, weighing in at a whopping six pounds, nine ounces, the most beautiful baby I had ever seen. Actually, a secret, all of my babies were the most beautiful babies I'd ever seen. <laughs> But Jack was there to meet her as quickly as he could get there, and it was love at first sight. He absolutely adored her. We brought her to our home in Harlan, Saskatchewan. The pin cherries were in blossom. It was gorgeous. And Marie's life journey had begun. She was sandwiched between her elder brother, Blake, and her younger brother, John. The best baby. She was so cuddly, and it was effortless to put her to sleep. A hug, and she fell asleep in my arms. As she got older, I would lay with her, and again, she fell asleep in my arms. Surrounded by cousins, some of whom are here today, love to the moon and back, she blossomed from a baby to a toddler to a little girl. She loved to be read stories, she loved to color, and we had coloring parties before bedtime. She loved her kitties, she loved to be outside with her brother, she loved to the, go to the garden, she loved. Oh, how she loved. When Marie was four, we moved to the Lloydminster area because we purchased Lloydminster Packers. And a new life begin, began for us, missing Harlan and home. We moved forward, kindergarten, and I enrolled Marie in French immersion. And she took to it like a duck to the water. Her preschool was over and her school days had begun. She learned to read English before the third year in which they began to teach it. She could just read. She became a voracious reader. Writing also came easily to her because she had an extensive vocabulary. Always quiet, reserved, introverted, she blossomed into a teenager. Partaking in activities, these are the ones she enjoyed. Swimming, skating, ballet, Ukrainian dance, and she did well in them. School days, summer holidays, extended family, extracurricular activities, reading, baking, and time passed. When she was about 15, Marie began to develop excruciating pain in her back and legs, severe. So severe that we made frequent visits to our family doctor, often diagnosed as pull muscles from dancing. Being referred here and there, a referral date would arrive, nothing, and no answers and the cycle would begin again. This was a painful time for Marie during those should be carefree teenage years. The cycle of pain persisted. And there were times I remember that I had to physically help her get out of bed. No luck finding answers, pain and frustration, until finally a rheumatologist in Saskatoon discovered Marie's ankylosing spondylitis, the bane of Marie's life. I will refer to it now as AS. AS, AS is a disease of the autoimmune system, a type of arthritis, and a chronic inflammatory disease. I don't want this to be a sob story. Marie would not want her eulogies, her mother's eulogy, to be a sob story. Marie bore this like a trooper. Unfortunately, the pain became her constant companion. Tired, struggling, hurting, we could do nothing. Jack and I were powerless to help, to help her as we witnessed our pretty, beautiful, sweet Marie trudge on like a soldier with her constant companion, pain. She hid it very well as best she could. The pain made my Marie more headstrong and determined to live her life. She had dreams, aspirations, goals. She was going to see the world. She obtained an arts degree from the U of A with majors in classics and linguistics, minors in French and English. Pain accompanied her through university, making study difficult. She persevered. She was no quitter. Her spirit was indomitable. In 2005, upon receiving her degree, she embarked upon her visits to many parts of the world, which most of us only dream of seeing. She was going to teach ESL in Asian countries, and so she did. 
And she was going to see as much of the world as she could, and so she did, because she had said to Jack and myself, my mobility might not allow me to do this when I'm older. My friends, she knew. She knew in her heart that her life here was shorter than the average person. She could feel it. Sadly, Jack and I could do nothing but let her go. This was no holiday she embarked upon. This was a mission. She was not doing all-inclusives in these countries. This was real. She knew the back alleys of countries such as Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, Seoul and Pusan, South Korea, Bangkok, Thailand, too many to mention, nor do I remember. A traveler, she was like no other. She arranged a month-long teaching gig for me with her in Seoul, South Korea, for the summer of 2009. She was, I think the picture, there's the picture. She was amazing. She, she took me places. We walked, did public transport, subways, fast trains, slept in unimaginable hostels, and I got to see Seoul. I mean, see Seoul. So I saw it. It wasn't just a hall. It wasn't a big hotel. I also visited her in Bangkok in 2014, and again, I got to see Bangkok, eat at those side street vendors, and travel the side streets amongst the people. Absolutely amazing. Thank you so much, Marie. Marie is here. She's here in this nice, beautiful box. She was always buying gifts, and, and this is a gift that she sent her dad and myself, and she's laid to rest in it. And always pain accompanied her, always tagging along. What can I say? Undaunted, fearless, courageous, she trudged on. She wouldn't talk to me of her pain because she knew I worried. Today's buzzword, I ruminated. Yes, I ruminated. I worried incessantly. Come home, Marie. Come home, my pretty Marie. My girl, stay home. Where's that water? And then it happened. She met Jackson. And in 2015, the witty Facebook picture of the bun in the oven happened. On 26th of February, 2016, Miss Madeline Yvette Taylor was born by C-section, as the gynecologist suggested, because of her AS. Because of her AS. Her nature was weakening. Her strength and courage and tenacity kept her striving forward. Madeline was the love of her life. If I can do anything, I can only let Madeline know how deeply her mother loved her. Needing to make a living, she worked for a time at a pizza joint, and then she, Jackson, and Madeline moved to South Korea for a short stint. In 2017, she returned home to begin a second career as she enrolled in the degree nursing program at Grant McEwen University. A single mom, she completed just about two years, and then COVID happened. COVID happened, and she froze with fear because of it. The love of Madeline, what if she contracted COVID? Who would take care of Madeline? She froze. She discontinued her nursing program for the time being and stayed home with Madeline, caring for Madeline, always about Madeline, and she trudged on, her nature declining. The strength and perseverance of Marie was unfathomable. No complaints about her AS. There are so many things I can say of my sweet, pretty Marie. Her kindness, her generosity, her gift-giving, creativity, her insightfulness, and intuition were superior. She could read human nature. Oh, I will miss our talks, the sleepovers with Madeline at my place so I wouldn't be alone. Her kindnesses to her mother. She always had a surprise and a little something for Madeline to excitedly show to Grandma. Thank you, sweetheart. And then, and then her alleluia. Her struggles were soon to end, breaking her foot, three bo broken bones, lack of mobility, and she died alone in her basement suite because of blood clots. My two wonderful nursing sisters-in-law predicted blood clots, that's Lenora and Shirley, before we even had the medical examiner's report. Blake has read extensively about AS, and he has learned that AS sufferers are three times more likely to die of blood clots than the average bear. She knew her life expectancy was short. My Marie knew. Her concern was the care of Madeline. She had sent Madeline to Vancouver Island to be with her dad for a short period of time. The Edmonton police were so kind to me when they finally discovered her in her suite. 
They allowed me to see her before her body was removed. In the latter years of Marie's life, she didn't like me hugging her, but I got to see her that day, and I got to hug her on March 25th. And let me tell you, she was that cute little girl who would fall asleep in my arms. I hugged her, and she was peaceful. I know in my heart that she died peacefully. Her struggles were over. And like in the very beginning, when Jack came as quickly as he could to see her, I know Jack was there for her again, being the first to welcome her into her new home, whatever, wherever it is. She will be laid to rest, like I said, with her dad, and her indomitable spirit is with her father again. This same spirit is with us today. Jackson, I know you will do well. Marie's legacy is Malin, and I know you will do well. We love Malin, and we will support you as much as we can in honor of Marie. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. And I, as matriarch of my little family, will strive on, inspired by Jack and Marie. My crumbling world will resurrect itself, and much good will come out of Marie's life story. It's not in vain. Life moves on. God's time is not our time. We only see the stitches on the backside of the quilt, not the beautiful design of the quilt's cover as planned by our Father Almighty. Who knows? Perhaps someday, soon, there will be no more struggles and pains from this debilitating disease of AS for anyone. A cure will be found. Rest in peace, my girl. Rest in peace. Thank you for 38.8 wonderful years. I was truly blessed, and I will always love you to the moon and back. Rest in peace, sweetheart. Probably should have went before the lawyer and the teacher, but... <laughs> Holy man, those are tough acts to fall. <laughs> Carter just wants to say a couple words here. What do you want to say, bud? Auntie Marie was nice when she was alive. What else about Auntie? She was the best auntie I could ever wish for. <laughs> All right. All right, well, this has been tough. Over the past few days, um, this common word said to us about Marie. She was kind, she was caring, she was selfless, she's beautiful, she's full of life, she's compassionate. She was such a light, she was always given, she was energetic. You know, in these tough times, we get to reflect, uh, we get to grieve, we get to think deeply about stuff, we get to laugh, we get to cry, we get to get angry. Um, we get to be grateful. We get to reunite. We get to get to, together. We loved her. We loved her a lot. <laughs> we get to share memories. What a humbling experience it was, actually, to go through her stuff and through her life. You know, going through it, it truly became about, less about how unfair it was, you know, less about how young she was, and really less about the why. Uh, honestly, and arguably, I don't know if I really got the answer I needed. But I was able to find some peace. I found a lot of pride. And I found a whole new love for my sister. I found strength. Through the last week, everyone's been saying, telling me to stay strong. And, you know, what's the meaning of strength? Is it the cry? Is it to hold on? Or is it to live like Marie? Is it to overcome the aches and pains and conquer the world each and every day? Each and every day of her life. We've heard lots, you know, she's lived a rare life. She was full of adventure, bungee jumping in Thailand, kickboxing in Mongolia, scuba diving in Indonesia, working in war-torn countries like Burma, traveling Jordan all alone, couch surfing the world. You know, one of the memories I have of Marie is she came to Edmonton after all these years of touring and I said, you, you can stay at my house. I got a nice room for you, I got nice quilts. No, she wanted to stay at the hostel. <laughs> she wanted to stay at the Edmonton hostel. And I, and I, I was like, it's so weird, but okay, I'll take her there. 
she goes there and she meets this guy and they just compared their passports. It was, it was her life. It was, it was so important to her. You know, and then, like, we've mentioned North Korea a few times. Like, there's just a few things that she was able to accomplish in such a short time. She had a double major. She was this beautiful little girl who we absolutely adore. She was halfway through a nursing degree. She was an amazing auntie. We always referred to her as Auntie Maui. (laughs) (laughs) You can laugh about that one. And she had to one nephew and three nieces, and she was such a supportive partner. Honestly, it would take most of us hundreds of years to accomplish what she did. Not even just to do what she did, but just to have the courage alone to do it. The drive. Marie accomplished so much in 38 years. She lived a lifetime. She lived her lifetime. And every moment to the fullest. Value. This means something to different to everybody. Some people like pretty things. Some people fast cars. Some people money. Some people value the crowds they associate with. Marie valued what was important to her. What was important in her life was making you happy. It was making you smile. It was making you feel special. It was sending you postcards on every occasion. It was the trinkets you have in your house that she sent you from all over the world. World. We live in one world. The different currencies you got sent, the stamps. Um, Value to me was the look my kids gave her when she greeted them. When they smiled at her and they said hello. <laughs> These simple things meant the world to her. These simple things meant the world to her. Valor to Marie was what filled your heart, no, how, no matter how she needed to do it. This is where I get selfish. Value to Marie for me was her endless support. She was my number one fan. God, and over the years, I became hers. She came to all my events. She knew my stats. She knew my job better than I did. (laughs) Don't know if I could have made it without her. The past year without her would have been really tough. She stuck by my side. She's always by my side. She cooked for my little family. She brought them toys. She was absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. (laughs) I got to go through Marie's stuff. She self-reflected often. You know, she wrote notes to herself. She wrote about all the good things in her life. This included simple things like the, the view from her room, the nice neighbor that said hi to her every morning, her cats. She wrote about the little money she had, and the little money she needed, her crave for the next adventure. And how many more months until Christmas? Well, this note I found actually in January. (laughs) Carter. How many books she could read on her next flight? She wrote about her family, and she wrote about her love for this little Madeline. These eyes of these three kids, the way she looked at them, the way they loved her, the way they love her, and the way they made her feel. Madeline, never forget that. Never forget how you made your your mommy feel, how you filled your heart, and how how truly powerful that was to her. She loved you three deeply. Madeline, for you, mommy. Tori, well, Josephine, Rosebud and Carter, Auntie Molly. Marie, I love you forever. Mm. I know you'll be my guardian angel for life. Thank you for being special, unique, and always by my side. I'll always love you, Marie. I have, I have very little to add to these wonderful eulogies that we've just heard. The whole time I, I kept being distracted by Mr. Ferk- Ferkel there, <laughs> Marie's first nursing patient. <laughs> I remember her nursing Mr. Ferkel back to health. I remember her going out to the Ganya, to the garden, 
we were growing up when we were little. That Ukrainian headdress, dancing together, being teenagers. We'd fight over books and CDs, which we'd steal from each other's rooms. <laughs> I wrote a little bit on the gifts that Marie gave, these gifts that would come to my doorstep from all over the world, stamped with foreign alphabets. I could only imagine the route that they'd travel. If you come visit my house, there is nowhere that you could set your eyes without seeing Marie and the amazing things she's done. And I think in a way, my sister and I shared a belief that things can have energy, that spirits can live in things. And these treasures which she's given me, these gifts, I've always cherished them. These things have always been my most prized possessions. And I will cherish them now more than ever. Thank you, Marie. She went to great troubles, great, great troubles to send me these things. She once sent me a musical instrument home from Mongolia. It was difficult to get because shipping from Mongolia was difficult. She tracked it and she brought it here. I, I, I don't really understand. I don't really understand the trouble that she took to get me this thing. And it arrived. And it's, it's a violin with two strings, like the ancient Mongols played. And it has a horse carved into the scroll. And in Mongolian culture, they keep these on the mantelpiece. And they believe that it blesses their home. And the sound is an ancient mystery. And I think there was a part of Marie that really knew that by sending me this, that I would understand. I would understand what she was experiencing. That by sending me this gift, she could teach me about these things that she was learning. I feel merely <clears throat> from the things that I've received from Marie that I've vicariously learned more about the world from that alone than all my own travels and studies. And it's in that way that I've realized what an incredible person my sister was. Mom, what you said, the biggest thing through all of this that has brought me a sense of closure is when mom told me that when she found her, she was lying there peacefully, like a sleeping child, and that mom could just hug her. Because when I learned that my sister had been found at the age of 38 years old, lying in her bed in her apartment, unresponsive, it was very, very difficult to make sense of, very difficult. And that thought has consoled me more than any other thought, that she was lying there peacefully. And like mom said, that she's with dad now. And a vision came to my mind, and maybe it's a fantasy. But what's brought me more solace in this than anything else is this vision of Marie, content in her solitude, peacefully going to sleep with dad, with dad there to say, come, come, sweet Marie. Come home with me. And when I visited that apartment, I, f I expected to feel something, like a spirit lingering, begging to remain of this earth, pleading that my time is too soon. But there was no such thing. Marie's spirit was long gone, traveling to the great beyond, as free as, as free as the wind. Anyway, we've made a video, and we're going to present it now. We used to love the Beatles together. Love Leonard Cohen. Enjoy this video.
A lot of you are in it. We did our best to show Marie from the time she was a baby and a little girl growing up to the most recent photos that we had. And they say a picture is worth a thousand words. So here it is.
So first of all, but you didn't get a chance to do it. Here's gonna be a little igloo for me, but now you can't do it for me. You didn't even get a chance to. Okay. But her did lots of other nice things when her was alive as well. <laughs> her gave me lots of hugs. <laughs> and took me sledding when it was snowing lots. And her took me skating. <laughs> And her gave me enough cuddles. <laughs> and, and. She read her book. Read books before my bedtime. Oh. Make cookies. What else? Did you love your mommy? I, I, I love my mommy. <laughs> And last of all, let's make this a really nice love story to make it a really nice story to make sure that it's, that I say hugs, 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 kiss, kiss, kiss from my mommy to you. I know that there are some others here as well that would like to share a few words, and I'm going to invite them to come at this time, if they can see past their teary eyes. Please do come at this moment. I'm Linnell, older cousin to Marie, as I'm sure most of you know, and between myself and my mom, Lenora, We've put our heads together to offer a few stories, memories, and thoughts of our be beloved gal, Marie. Dear family, dear family, thank you for this opportunity. This is a special gathering today to honor our special girl, Marie Eaton. Our Marie was a beautiful, young, independent woman and mother. God needed a girl just like her. We don't want to know what their understandings were. And we are trying to comprehend this unbelievable situation. There are no words, there are no answers for this unexpected happenings. We only know that we do have many precious memories of Marie to hold in our hearts forever, each and every one of us, of our dear Marie Eaton. Marie was a precious baby girl, the pride and joy of her mom and dad, Jack and her Dean Eaton and big brother Blake. As she grew up, a wee little girl she had a mind of her own, and it didn't take her very long to be ruling the roost at their house. She was as a little mother to John, her baby brother, when he rounded out the family and made it complete. It didn't take her long to wrap the boys and her mom and dad around her little finger And get, a, and get on with her life. A life filled of many goals. She was a very unique person. A one of a kind, kind of gal. Above all, Marie has been admired for her motherhood. A second to none kind of mother to Madeline, whom she loved with all her heart. We know that she loved you, little girl. Just love you to pieces. Madeline is a beautiful child of five years old. Very much a duplicate of her mother at that age. 
a little girl with a mind of her own. And that's a good thing. Wherever Marie's adventures took her, she never forgot her simple beginnings of Harlan and even Lloyd Minster. Her thoughts of home and her special roots. Always remembering Christmas ties, sending postcards and little trinkets to us from all over the world. Marie was born May 14th, 1982. I graduated high school May 16th, 1982. I can safely say we didn't run in the same circles as she was entering the world I was going out to find my way. When Brian and I were first married and living in Lloydminster, on occasion, we babysat for Jack and Erdine. To our small third floor apartment came two rambunctious little ones, Blake and Marie, with baby brother John in tow. It was evident then that you, Marie, would set out to be your own person with your own ideas, your own feelings, and your own original experiences. Being the product of an eaton beset union, Marie, you would grow up with strong characteristics of both families. Those characteristics and traits took you places, places we have never been to see things we have never seen. Marie, you are the most adventurous person I know to this day. I say adventurous, but brave comes to mind, as do numerous other descriptions such as bold, audacious, confident, gutsy, rash, maybe reckless, but definitely dynamic. I am truly sure that it was you that invented the term selfie. I have seen hundreds of photos, even saw some in the slideshow, of of Marie, of you, documenting your experiences and worldly explorations. Pictures of you there, even before cell phones had cameras. I admired your ability to, on your own, by yourself, travel every, anywhere in the world. And while living there, immerse yourself in the life and culture of that country. Few people can do this. You were amazingly special. Your brother Blake recently described you as charismatic and flamboyant, definitely. Unique, of course. Eccentric, a bit. Intriguing, fascinating, stubborn. All personality traits and characteristics that took you places. Mom mentioned our wonderful family Christmases and how you never forgot. Well, tucked in a drawer at home, I still have a gold and red heart-shaped shell with a little gold bell and a purple tassel given to me by you, Marie, many years ago when you came all the way home for Christmas. Your most recent adventure, motherhood. What a fantastic life you were providing for your beautiful five-year-old daughter, Madeline, ingraining in her a keen sense of multitudes of cultural and culinary experiences as you explored the world together, doing your very best to provide an independent, most wholesome, rounded life for an energetic little girl. I can hardly wait to see where she will go and what she will be when she grows up. With your angel arms wrapped around us, your family and friends, we will always and forever know you're with us. Places, smells, tastes, and the world around us will remind us you are near. Until we meet again, Marie, I, your older cousin, will admire you, miss you, and love you forevermore. Mom, have a little prayer. Yes, we will, we will miss you. We will miss, where's Marie now? What's Madeline doing? We'll be checking. We'll be wanting to know how you uh, cultivate this mind of your own. 
We love you, Marie. And we know that you love us too, in your way. You are in our hearts forever, and nobody can take that away. To the family, I have a little prayer. I said a prayer for you today. I know God must have heard. I felt the answer in my heart, although he said no words. I didn't ask for wealth or fame. I know you wouldn't mind. I asked him to send treasures of a far more lasting kind. I asked him to be near you at the start of every day, to grant you love and blessings and friends to share your way. I asked for special happiness in all things big and small, but it was for his loving care I ask for most of all. Hello, everyone. For those of you who don't know, my name is Yvette Shu. Marie was one of only two very special nieces on the Bassett side of the family. I was 15 years old when Marie was born, and I believe that her dean was 16 years old when I was born. So that puts me smack dab in the middle in fact, a wee bit closer in age to Marie. My oldest daughter, Lara, came along 14 years later and was Marie's much younger cousin. Lara had a few memories of Marie that she wanted me to share with you today. One thing I can say about Marie is that she was a natural beauty. In fact, my daughter, Lara, recalls a time, about 10 years ago, when Marie was asked for ID when we were together at a restaurant in Lloydminster. We were in Lloyd for a horse show, and Marie happened to be home at the same time, and a bunch of us got together at a restaurant for a big visit. Marie told us that she often got asked for ID, even though she was getting close to 30 years old. My daughter remembered that I told Marie that day that she looked so young because she was a natural beauty who rarely wore makeup and was very okay with being who she was. Marie was indeed a natural beauty. Lara also recalls Marie telling us that evening about her students, I think it was in Korea or one of the far off places that she had taught. She showed them a, a photo she had of her two little Canadian cousins, my two daughters. Apparently her students marveled at her blue eyed little cousins and Marie found that quite amusing that her students hadn't seen blue eyes before. I recall Marie telling us many stories about her students from afar, and she always spoke about them with such genuine enthusiasm and pride. I think she was a good teacher, and her love of children was evident. On March 14th of this year, just a little over a week before Marie's passing, I phoned Marie as I was concerned about how she was managing with her broken foot. Well, what was intended to be a quick, how are you doing phone call, turned into the most amazing three hour visit. We both so openly shared so much with each other. It was a very easy and natural conversation. And I know that we both hung up the phone that day, feeling uplifted. To me, that phone visit that day was a pure gift and something I will cherish forever. Marie spoke so sensibly, so intelligently, so calmly, so genuinely. She did not say one bad word about anyone. I remember that one of the last things I told her was that I loved her and that I thought she was truly an amazing person. To end, I would like to share a little story of my own with you. This past Saturday, my husband and I went to Medicine Hat to do some errands, and I was on the hunt for our family's favorite marshmallow bunnies for Easter. The first store I went in did not have the candies I was looking for, but it did have a lot of cute Easter things. And this, of course, got me thinking about little kids and the Easter Bunny, and of course, about Madeline. 
I decided I would gather a few things to put together to give Madeline. I found a bin with some stuffed animal bunnies, and I was picking through them as they were all different shapes and colors. I was having trouble deciding, so in my heart and in my mind, I asked Marie to help me pick the bunny for Madeline. I had no sooner finished my internal request to Marie when an elderly lady who was walking by stopped and said to me, are you having trouble picking? I like that one. <laughs> As she pointed to her favorite. She asked if it was for me and I said, no, it's for my great niece. And she said, well, I like the ears on that one. So needless to say, my decision had been made. And for the rest of that day, I couldn't help but feel that Marie had helped me pick out that bunny for her precious Madeline. So Jackson, if my experience was any indication, if you are ever feeling like you need help with something, especially if it has to do with Madeline, I think maybe all you'd have to do is ask and Marie will find a way to help you. <laughs> so Marie, I will say goodbye for now. From myself, your Uncle Tim, and cousins Lara, Cassidy, and Jackson. I will cherish the pretty white purse you brought home for me from your travels afar. I think it was Kuwait, but I'm not sure. I will miss your Instagram posts of your adventures with your Edmonton baby. I will miss your punny little picture postcards of Madeline that I would receive in the mail a couple times a year. Rest easy, Marie, until we meet again. And This is for Madeline. My name's Maureen Fielding. I'm the stepmom of Jackson, and I'm speaking here today on behalf of the Taylor family in Vancouver, my family in Vancouver, and friends that are there who couldn't, couldn't make it here. Um, for Erdine and family, there are no words to express our sadness and shock at the sudden passing of Marie. Our hearts go out to you and family in this tragic loss. We will miss the ongoing group texts of all the adventures of Marie and Madeline. The regular photos and videos always brought a smile to our faces. She would send photos of when that little Mexican dress we got for her finally fit. So sweet and thoughtful. We received a log of all Madeline's accomplishments from dance to her first bike ride and skating. We will miss her laughter, her joy and love as she would recount something that Madeline said or did. Marie may have had difficulties in her life, but we will always remember her as Madeline's mother, who loved that child with every cell of her body. She revolved her life around her, enriching her life with great imagination and introducing her to every festival or cultural event possible. Holidays were celebrated with heart and were planned ahead for months. Marie's artistic ability and creativity came to light in countless hours spent on arts and crafts with Madeline. She put love into all she did for others, including cooking and baking. All these attributes brought unique experiences of enrichment for Madeline. There will be a huge hole where she was and we will do our best to honor her memory with Madeline. 
we hope we can reciprocate the ongoing connection with the family here, as Marie did with us. Thank you. Try to be quick. <laughs> okay, so I'm I'm Marie's cousin Marcy. Uh, we grew up together here in Lloydminster. Um, she was one of my few extended family members who lived near me. We're just a few years apart in age. Me, just five years older than her. On the Bassett side of the family, Marie and I were the only two female cousins in amongst a gaggle of male cousins, <laughs> really. <laughs> and we remained the only two girls until we were in our later teen years. Uh, we were sort of the first generation females in the family, cousins. In our immediate families, Maria and I both had brothers. As much as we were blessed to have wonderful brothers, neither of us had a sister. Growing up in the same town as Marie, our family spent a lot of time together and she often filled that void of that sisterly connection. I'm not really sure if I can recall specific memories that stand out. However, we spent so much time together that it's just a collection of memories and moments that have blended together. Playing with dolls when we were little, playing games together, spending holidays together, and later talking about boys, friends, school, and hobbies. Marie was a fairly private person, so it was probably me doing most of the talking. Um, but she was my family member who I could share girl talk with. And just as close family members can, can be, we could have some pretty good disputes and arguments too. She was stubborn, but then again, so am I. <laughs> and don't think that I say stubborn as a negative word. By stubborn, I mean she was passionate and driven. She was intelligent, educated, and determined. She had goals and intentions to achieve them. It's almost ironic that I can remember having some good disputes with her because she was also somewhat reserved of a person. She had such a big heart and was an extremely caring person and had one of the greatest and unique laughs. <laughs> I'll miss her laugh. As much as we had several differences in our personalities, we always enjoyed spending time together. In adulthood, our lives went in different directions, and I didn't see her more than once or twice a year. But when we did see each other, I enjoyed hearing about her travels, her experiences, and the next adventure she was planning. I admired how she had the courage to go into the world on her own and completely immerse herself into a totally foreign culture. I was delighted when Marie replanted her roots back in Canada and started her family. I've enjoyed hearing about her adventures in motherhood. I'm so sorry that this adventure has come to a close for her. As Easter brings new beginnings, I pray that God has planned a new beginning and a new adventure that will bring her eternal happiness. Thank you. Well, I think it's all been said. It kind of amazes me how none of us got together and we're all saying the same thing. So <laughs> those traits were pretty powerful. I'm Erdine's younger sister. Um, Marie was the second oldest of four nieces on our Bassett side. Unfortunately, due to living in opposite corners of the province, I did not have the privilege to spend lots of time with Marie as she was growing up. Usually one time a year, Erdine and I would make sure to get a visit in, and we would take turns on alternate summers packing up our families and spend a couple days with each other to do the traveling. And so it was during these um, yearly visits that I got to personally connect with Marie a bit more. But she was always a really quiet girl, but you knew she was really taking the conversation in. She didn't have to talk a lot. That's what I liked about her. She didn't have to talk a lot to know how she was feeling as her facial expressions were a window to her heart. If she enjoyed something, you would see that really poker straight face, kind of break into a grin. And then if she really liked it, she'd really burst into a smile. And then all of a sudden you'd hear that hearty laugh break out. 
But if she didn't like what she was hearing, I remember Marie's lips really tightening up and she would kind of, <laughs> and her eyes were like, that's a load of crap. <laughs> Marie grew up and then the annual visits with her became non-existent for me as she was exploring the world and sharing her strong linguistic skills like we all know, teaching English in many remote parts of the world. Regardless of where she was, like she, it's been mentioned many times, she would always remember her relatives back home as one would receive a postcard of, or some cultural present from a part of the world that I couldn't even pronounce. It's like, oh, I don't know, you have to look it up in the map. But her teaching was very much a significant part of her adult life. And like Yvette said, when she would talk about it, you could see she really had that passion and that love for what she was doing. And again, mentioned over and over, her greatest passion, however, was when she became a mother. Motherhood was her top priority in her life these past five years. She truly loved Madeline to the moon and back. And her pride and love, as has been mentioned, we all have the pun little postcards of Madeline, but Marie's humble nature, it was always just that picture of Madeline, that special picture of Madeline with some funny little saying. I still have, I have one in my fridge, fridge right now. She was truly a self-sacrificing mom as her decisions and life revolved around taking care of Madeline. We are all saddened by this loss. Our, help, our heart goes out to those closest to her. Her life was truly short and sweet, but by living it with such a determined and vivacious nature, she truly has left a personal legacy that we can all be aspired by. Rest peacefully, sweet Marie. Wow, thank you for sharing. You, uh, you've honestly shared some amazing stories and some, some things that you will remember for a long time to come. One of my favorite authors, Eugene Peterson, he says this, it's easier to find guides, someone to tell you what to do, than someone to be with you in this discerning, prayerful companionship as you work it out yourself. That's what spiritual direction is. And I feel like you've all woven, a, woven together the story of Marie's life and have shared bits and pieces of maybe others didn't know and to bring out a tapestry that reminds us, that reminds us of a life well lived, that reminds us of a life that was full of adventure, that was not afraid to take a risk, not afraid to, to try something new. You know, and as we've pondered, and I know that there's been many strings that have been pulled in and many stories that have come together. As a minister who's never met Marie, you've made it a lot harder for me to now tie all these strings together. But my hope's desire is this, is that as I try to bring these together, that we would ponder death's meaning with a different perspective. That we'd look and say, okay, you know what? Marie's life has definitely impacted each one of us. Her life has not ended. It's just beginning for some of us. Some of the stories that you heard of just tweaking your memories anew. It's like, ah, let me incorporate that. Let me, let me see that facet. Let me live that kind of way. Let, let me be adventurous. I want to encourage you with the stories that you've heard, with the anecdotes that you've heard, with the funny stories and the life of, of adventure. I pray that you would think about death's meaning in a different way. As a conscious and self-conscious life, we know that death is inevitable. We know that death shapes our life, even it's shaped your life as we have gathered here today. Most of the time we can accept the principle of death as an abstract principle. It's a dispassionate fact of life. Part of the biological chain of generation being 
begetting generation. But when death becomes personal, through someone we have known, respected, and loved, it comes in a variety of guises and triggers of varying of emotions. When death comes to those of many years, our grief is a quiet sadness. But when it comes to one who has suffered and endured painful illness, our grief is now softened by a sense of welcome, welcomed and even blessed relief. I can't imagine what it would be like to live with a disease like she lived with, to have the pain but yet to push past the pain, to push through the pain, and to, to not let that run and rule her life. Oh, I know that I'm kind of a suck when it comes to getting sick or having an illness. If my wife was here, she would say, yes, that's true. But as you've heard from Marie's life, she didn't allow her life to be marked by an illness but by experiences. And we have those same choices, don't we? We have those same opportunities, don't we? You see, it's what we do with life. It's what we do while we're living that makes a life. Many people think, well, finances make a life. No, finances do not make a life. Some people think, well, position makes a life. No, a position doesn't make a life. Living makes a life. It's what we do with what we've been given. I'm sure as, as Marie traveled, she could see many people who have far less than most of us. And yet happy and enjoying life. Because life is not marked by a bank account balance. Life is not marked by a position. Life is marked by those in which we have impacted. Those in which we have shared our life with. No matter what the guise of death wears, we being human, will all day face, one day face that. We will try to understand death but honestly, as a minister, there's often no words to say. Because I've not met many people that know exactly the day and the moment and the hour and the minute of which they pass. But we do know this. There is comfort for those who mourn. And so even as you're here today, you may be harboring or even feel running with different emotions. You may feel abandoned. You may feel that this death remembers the hurts and the wrongs of not being able to say one more word, of not being able to say goodbye. But as you go through these range of emotions, accept them. Understand them. They are doors into life's deeper understandings. Death always brings us face to face with life. Where we have to take a look at our own lives. And we take an inventory of how we live. There's an opportunity in this moment there, and there is means to begin to live life again. Remembering, though, incorporating the life of others. I pray that your life would be enriched as you remember, as you recall Marie's life. Though she may not be present on this earth, she can be with you in your hearts in your thoughts, in your actions, in your attitudes, in the way in which you treat others.
You see, there's an opportunity in this moment. There's a means to begin to live life again. Though hesitant, hesitantly at first, probably slowly even at first, from this moment on, in our living and our doing, we can be more virtuous, more abundant. And that's one of the paradoxes of this situation, isn't it? When those of us who are living remember those who have passed, we say, how do we go on? How do we live again? I think Marie would tell you, don't, don't you dare stop living. Don't you dare give up. Don't you dare just sit down. As her family was sharing with me the pain of the, this horrible disease that she's lived with, I'm like, wow, remarkable. I think many of us would have just sat down, but she chose to keep going. She chose to keep, to keep living. And so in the paradox of life versus death, you see there are many around us that are, although maybe living, have already died. I want to encourage you to keep living, to keep going, to keep memories alive, to keep hope alive. There's a poem I, f I found. It said, it's not a miracle. I'm sorry, it's a miracle. Nothing less than a miracle. The flowers that bloom every spring. That living thing begets living thing. That we are human beings emerge again and again. From ignorance to knowledge, from hopelessness to meaning, from sadness to joy. It's a miracle. Nothing less than a miracle. Marie loved poetry and the family shared with me a, a, a book of poetry that she had. And I want to read a poem to you from it. She had it marked, in fact, in this book. And the section is titled Death. Then Amitra spoke, saying, We would ask now of death. And he said, You know the secret of death. But how shall you find it unless you seek it in your heart of life? The owls whose night eyes are blind unto the day cannot unveil the mystery of light. If you would indeed behold the spirit of death, open your heart wide unto the body of life. For life and death are one even as the river and the sea are one. The depths of your hopes and desires lie, your silent knowledge of the beyond. And like seeds dreaming beneath the snow, your heart dreams of spring. Trust the dreams, for in them is hidden the gate to eternity. Your fear of death is but the trembling of the shepherd who, when he stands before the king, whose hand is laid upon him in honor, is the shepherd not joyful beneath his trembling? That he shall wear the mark of the king, yet is he not more mindful of his trembling? For what is it to die but to stand naked in the wind and to melt into the sun? And what is it to cease breathing but to free the breath from its restless tides that it may rise and expand and seek God unencumbered? Only when you drink from the river of silence shall you indeed sing. And when you have reached the mountaintop, then you shall begin to climb. And when the earth shall claim your limb, 
then shall you truly dance. I want to encourage you. with one more quote that I found again from my, an author that I enjoy, Eugene Peterson. And this is what he says. And so we gain hope, not from the darkness of our suffering, not from pat answers in books, but from the God who sees our suffering and shares our pain. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you that you do see our suffering and you do share our pain. For those you understand, you understand all of our emotions, all of our thoughts, all of our feelings, for you have created them. I pray, God, that you would be with us, that you would strengthen us, that you, Heavenly Father, would guide us and keep us. I pray, Lord, for Marie's family. I pray, Father, that you would have your hands upon each one who is gathered here today and even those who could not be here. Lord, help us to live remembering a life that was well lived. In Marie, would you strengthen us, Lord, today? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.